Well, here we are in the perfectly pleasant city of Kenosha, Wisconsin, walking through the ruins that remain after national obsession. In the summer of 2020, on this block of cracked concrete, a cell phone captures what we've been told is a common occurrence in this country. A black man getting gunned down by a white police officer. The clip instantly goes viral, sparking days of mass protests and nights of violent riots. Three days after the shooting, a baby-faced teenager comes to Kenosha with an AR-15. His night ends in fatal chaos and the birth of a new viral obsession, a murder trial that's must-watch TV. These twin tragedies were instantly beamed into every cranny of our lives, and yet no one knows what really happened. Oh. What is wrong with you? Sorry, I thought I canceled this subscription and I still have it. I really need to figure out how to handle my finances better. Yeah, no, I used to have the same problem. I just use hiatus. Hiatus? Uh, it's super easy. I'll explain it to you. Just no more of those weird growly sounds, please. Download the app. You'll be able to see all your subscriptions and cancel the ones that you don't need or want. See which of your monthly bills are negotiable and hiatus will negotiate for you. And you'll be able to set up a custom budget. So good. That's so a good trailer. Good. I mean, that's a good trailer. I mean, it's a good trailer. He did a good job. Of yeah. That introduction. I'm like, oh, this is a mixed blessing. How in God's name am I going to live up to the hype right now? It's impossible. It's, that can't be done. <laughs> no, you, you can do like, it. You oh, can do it. Like Scorsese okay. of conservative mini docs. I'm like, no, bro. I don't. <laughs> so, yeah. no. no, no. I would call this. I mean, to me, this is a apolitical um documentary you're it's it's not political this is uh societal really um let me give you a proper introduction here rob monts you're the ceo and co-founder of good kid productions correct correct uh documentary maker uh i love your bio by the way uh you said a uh, degree in um psychology no was that what it was but philosophy. yeah the, please get it right philosophy philosophy i'm so sorry you know it's blonde um and I, I love that you said, what was it? Zero marketing skills or something? Marketable, marketable skills. skills. Marketable, marketable skills. skills. Yeah. Absolutely I, no I love ability that. to produce value for other humans. Yeah. I love Thank I you love for reminding this. me what I was like at 22. I appreciate it. <laughs> no problem. No problem. It's what I'm here for. It's what I'm yeah, here for. Yeah, great. My little so, tadpole self. My little yeah. tadpole self. I have big dreams. I have big dreams. Not a lot of hard skills, unfortunately, to accompany the big dreams. That's a, yeah. you got to have both I, in combination. And my 20s were basically an extraordinarily painful process of realizing ambition alone is not enough. You do actually yeah, have, have skills that generate value for your fellow humans. And I, I got the, I got it eventually. I mean, I'm approaching 40. It took a while. I was a slow learner. I was a slow learner, but I Listen, did. I didn't grow up until I was 42. So, you know, that okay. was when so I started I adulting. Yeah. yeah, that was a while ago, but yeah, absolutely. No, um, I, I get that. I get that on such a, a core, core level for sure. And um, so last night or uh, yesterday afternoon, uh, Juan, Juan ambushed me. He said, hey, uh, what are you doing tomorrow? And I said, oh, um, uh, actually, it's a pretty quiet day. And he says, OK, good. Um, you're going to co-host a two hour show with me. And by the way, it's live. And I said, OK. And he said, next, he said, I'm sending you uh, this uh, information on a, a guest we're having on and a documentary that uh, that they put together and uh, watch it and, you know, be prepared, be ready. So I said, oh, God, OK, OK, no, I can do this. I can do this. And uh, I, I opened up the documentary and I started watching it. And uh, I think it's a total of, what, 28 minutes? I think it was like 28 minutes, um, 28 of the best minutes I've spent in a, in a little while because it was so, so good. It was so unexpected, um, the angle. Now, I'm a law enforcement spouse. And I study, I, I paid a lot of attention to that case and all of the other ones too, so that I could um, have intelligent conversations with people who wanted to come at me with unintelligent conversations. Mm -hmm. And uh, so as soon as you shut in, I don't want to give too much away. I want to leave that to you as to yeah, what yeah. you share. Um, but the seven tenets of yeah, what yeah. really happened, I was literally, I, I was literally fist pumping, like, Gah! you tell them. <laughs> <laughs> like aggressively pleased and 
then you went further. So I kind of want to give this over to you a little yeah. bit. Tell me about the making of this documentary. Well, I just want to make sure people know that. So Good Kid Productions, we're a, we're a kind of a documentary production house. Kind of the whole thesis of the company is that we kind of have Netflix quality production in terms of just cameras and audio mixing and color correction. But we couple it by telling stories that establishment Hollywood institutions would never tell or tackling topics that they would never topic or exploding certain political pretenses that saturate <laughs> uh, Los Angeles and New York City. And so we have our own channel that we're kind of growing now and people can watch the documentary we're going to talk about right now on that channel for free, just Broken Boys of Kenosha on the Good Kid Productions YouTube channel. There are a couple restrictions on it. You have to sign in. We can get into that if you want to. There's been some kind of gangster covert censorship of oh, the yeah. message the, the, of the documentary. The gang over. I'm not like an Alex Jones type normally. I don't, I'm not InfoWars, but things that have occurred to us the last couple of weeks have made me slightly more sympathetic to, um, I don't know, the, the, the one world elite alliance that is turning the fish gay or whatever it is that Alex Jones's latest monologue is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's about- latest. So the documentary centers on Kenosha, Wisconsin, who your your audience is probably maybe vaguely familiar with. In the summer of 2020, it's, 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 it's a small kind of bedroom community in Wisconsin. Kenosha had this rare distinction of birthing two different mega viral news incidences in, the, in a span of just 72 hours. So very rare. Yeah. And the first one was about a week after George Floyd had been killed. A black man by the name of Jacob Blake is shot getting into his car on the north side of Kenosha. It's captured on a cell phone, like a six or seven second clip, uploaded probably to Facebook, I think, instantly goes mega viral. Yep. In part because this, the, the primary corporate storytellers, the establishment media operations of this country had convinced themselves and then attempted to convince the American public that what was captured on that cell phone was George Floyd 2.0. It was another instance of vicious institutional racism against an unarmed innocent black man. That's what that's the story that we were told. Right. We'll get into whether or not uh, that actually matches a reality in a second. But just again, they pump that message that this was grotesque institutional racist injustice into the American people. That inspires somewhere between five to six thousand outside protesters to descend on Kenosha. The political leadership of Wisconsin catastrophically fails to properly equip the city to protect itself against these freedom fighters slash violent riders. And then Kenosha is subjected to three straight nights of violent rioting, which primarily ends up victimizing the historic black business district of Kenosha, which is again, another odd achievement for Black Lives Matter and our anti-racist, um, uh, whatever, anti-racist activists. On the third night of riots, Kyle Rittenhouse, again, another name I'd imagine your audience is familiar with, drives to his Kenosha, picks up uh, his AR-15 in a medic bag on the way down there in order to answer the call to come protect a used car dealership. And that night is the night where he ends up shooting three people and killing two of them, which prompts another enormous mega viral news story and his murder trial, in which he's eventually acquitted, that's like, you know, wall-to-wall -wall cable news coverage. Right. And our whole thesis of the documentary, the first half of it is lovingly decimating the propagandistic narrative that emerged around Jacob Blake, primarily with the aid of an interview with, with Bill Barr, former attorney general. Great interview, but by the way. And on the second half, we actually found a trauma that is shared by Jacob Blake, Kyle Rittenhouse, and two other main characters of that tragedy, kind of a generational epic challenge mm -hmm. for this country that got entirely missed by the media's rush to try to push this, push what happened into Kenosha into these neat political packaging. So that's what people can expect. Yeah. Was that discovery uh, accidental? I, so was that the angle of the documentary initially, or did that become a focus of that when you realized that? Yeah, I have a buddy of mine, Eli Steele, who did a documentary a couple of years ago with his dad, Shelby Steele, who's this like incredible kind of dissident black conservative intellectual. 
deconstructing the Michael Brown case, the Ferguson, mm -hmm. Missouri, which is kind of the you know ground zero for the modern Black Lives Matter movement. And it just kind of, it does what we do with Jacob Blake, which is just show uh, virtually everything that you were told about this incident was an active lie. It, like, mm -hmm. It's actually what I've taken to call an anti-truth because it's not just wrong. It literally, they're telling you something that is going to cause you to draw the exact wrong lessons from what actually happened in right. Michael Brown's case or for Jacob Blake's case. And we were going to do the same thing with Jacob Blake. But I think over the course of my investigation, I ended up noticing mm. this tie that we'll get into eventually, right? Yeah. Which yeah. is not, but I think it's prime, but it's also, I mean, I don't know if this is interesting to people, but I'm deeply psychologically primed to pick up on what I picked up on because mm -hmm. I'm a father of three, married, um, but am myself a product of divorce, product of a, a charismatic but occasionally psychologically abusive father who proceeded to drop dead when I was 19. Oof. And, you know, I'm approaching 40. I'm I'm embracing and I'm loving and I'm recognizing my, my own traumas in order to, mm -hmm. you know, process them to become a better man and make sure, most importantly, I don't pass them on to my own kids. Mm -hmm. And that's the psychological background to when I'm diving into this subject matter late last year, uh, or I guess earlier this year, and, and noticing that every single major character in this story grew up without a dad. Mm -hmm. Every single one of them. Yeah, and, you know, and you, you know, and you dig into it further though, and you realize that's extraordinarily scandalously common in this country. One out of yeah. every three American boys is raised without a dad. It's crazy. Yeah, one out of every three. That's crazy to me. Um, I guess it shouldn't be because that is the reality. That's the that's um, common, you know, as as common as divorce. You know, what's the? Uh, I don't even think the statistics are correct anymore. But you know, I remember growing up, right up growing up, but I remember for decades hearing that you know fifty or sixty percent of marriages end in divorce and all that stuff. You know, so the precursors are there already telling you, oh, you're going to fail. You're you're bound to fail. So. Um, yeah. You know, so just expect for your marriage to fail instead of, you know, expect to work hard to make a marriage work and, and do the things you need to do. But the fatherlessness is that is staggering. And, you know, the thing about that for me, is, well, you know, so let me say this instead. I know there's going to be people and they may even be in the comments already. I don't know that will say, oh, just because there isn't a father in the home, you're saying that you're going to grow up to be a criminal or you're going to go up to make, you know, terrible choices in life and all that. And, you know, it's not a blanket statement. Not every person who grows up without a good father figure is going to grow up to be garbage. There are people, I, I'll use my husband as an example. My husband grew up without his uh, biological father in the picture. He grew up with a very strong um, mother with strong values, uh, just salt of the earth kind of kind of woman, good, great work ethic, all of the things. And um, his lack of father figure actually made him become um, more determined to be better, you know, to do better, to be better. And that, and that's part of like kind of what you said, that introspection, that uh, self-assessment that just isn't common. It does, doesn't necessarily happen as much as it should. So you are actually extremely fortunate uh, in that regard that, you know, you took circumstances. And of course, I'm not saying that you had a horrible childhood by any means. Um, I wouldn't make those assumptions, but uh, you had things that you knew were wrong and you are different or not right. And you said, well, I'm not going to do that in my life. I'm going to do things differently. And that's maybe part of what's lacking in a lot of that. Right. Um, and I'm not here to deny human agency. Like mm -hmm. we're not, there's something, you know, and I say this as someone who's like secular, but becoming a little more squishy and new age as I age every day. Right. Mm -hmm. But like, you know, there's something, there's something miraculous and transcendent about the human will, you can make choices somehow that are outside of, you know, it's not everything's biologically determined, not everything's preset at day one because of neurochemicals, right? You can make right. choices. But you know, when I was 22, I was kind of a naive, self-righteous libertarian where I thought there was a purity of the will where everything mm. is primarily a product. Like everyone's a, everyone's a Ayn Rand superhero in the waiting if you just make the right choices, right? Mm -hmm. and, and anything that, goes wrong in your life is primarily because of your own moral failings or mm. reasons, whatever it might be. Then you grow up, get your ass kicked a little bit, have some kids, 
have the kids kick your ass, have life kick your ass. And um, you, you notice the obvious thing, which is we're not purely the product of our own choices, obviously, like I'm right. obviously, right? And that you can be, you, you're deeply shaped by the circumstances of your formative years for better or for worse, right? Yeah. And you can, you're, the framework that you use to make choices can be morphed and broken and misshapen by the people that are charged with tending to you as you're emerging as a human, right? Into mm -hmm. your into your skull, into the world. Yeah, right. And, and it's also, so nothing's destiny. Nothing is destiny. Right. Um, I mean, uh, the, the, do, the big documentary we did before, this is about a, a professor at Harvard University who got mm. canceled because he broke from certain woke progressive pieties. People can also watch that for free on the YouTube channel as well on Good Kid Productions. This guy named Roland Fryer, who's a once in a generation economic genius, was also raised without a dad. Mm -hmm. And through pure, pure grit and intellectual virtuosity has pulled himself to the highest realms of American intellectual achievement, right? Mm -hmm. So I, nothing's destiny. Right. But, like, but the data does speak for itself. And, we, yes. and what we do is we call it like the rough mathematics of human flourishing, which is if you pull a dad from the house for a boy, the chances that he drops out of high school, is long-term unemployed, mm -hmm. and... Um, What's the, what's the third one? I think oh, and develop and has uh, goes to jail. All three of those things, if the dad is pulled out of the house, the likelihood of all three of those things doubles. Mm. Okay. So it makes yeah. it radically, dramatically more like Yeah, absolutely. Right? Yeah. And and I love the way you explain this in the documentary too. You do a great job of of showing how this works and, and how that happens. And and uh and, <laughs> and I see here. Uh, someone has commented, uh, but you're white, so you had better options to climb out of it. And that's, of course, the the conception. That's like, right? yeah, the, I guess he's like, miming kind of the, we, or the retard progressive take on things. Part of yeah. the reason that we took it, but what we wanted to say was, of course, you read Shelby Steele or you read Glenn Lowry or John McWhorter, and they're excellent about discussing the epidemic of fatherless, fatherlessness in Black America, which... Mm -hmm. Like that's raw dog truth right there. Like it's just true yeah, that I think it's 75%. Yeah, the last I read was like 70%. Wedlock, right? mm -hmm. But we purposely wanted to transcend the kind of predictable partisan narrative about this because right. the rates of fatherlessness in the white community, while not equivalent to the black one, are mm -hmm. rapidly catching up. And right. you, the, the Daniel Patrick Moynihan in the 1960s very mm -hmm. famously had that huge report on, on the, the the challenges of Black America, and one of mm -hmm. the things that he diagnosed was the rate of fatherlessness. Mm -hmm. And today, in 2023, white America has the same rate of fatherlessness that caused Daniel Patrick Moynihan heart palpitations in 1965. So mm -hmm. it's as bad now as it was back then. And back then, he was saying. This is a existential crisis, right? Mm -hmm. Existential crisis. Yes. So yeah. We, absolutely. We purposely and wanted to say that it's a a thoroughly biracial phenomenon, right? And I think the fatherlessness epidemic is an essential fueler of mm -hmm. these, you know, deaths of despair that we're seeing in the white community, where people grow up with deep wounds and traumas, right. and they think that they can anesthetize themselves, boys in particular, mm -hmm. with opioids and porn and call of duty. And it turns right. that doesn't actually fix the underlying trauma. And the trauma is not your fault, but it, it is your responsibility. Right, right. Yeah. You know, and you know, the three main components of the documentary, which are, of course, are Jacob Blake, um, Kyle Rittenhouse, and uh, why am I drawing a blank on his name? Uh, Rosen. Well, there's, there's two other people. There's Rosenbaum okay. and then Anthony Huber, the two people that Kyle Rittenhouse. Okay. Was. Yeah. And, um, you know, the parallels. Don't give too much away. Don't give too yeah, much away. Yeah, I know. I know. I'm like, I've introduced get... you now for media appearances. We're allowed to talk about two of the four, but okay. if, wanna, if they want to get the full expanse, of, yep. Of, okay. Uh, you know, I you know you yeah you, you got to give them a little taste. We got to give them a little taste, but not okay. everything. Not everything. Gotcha. <laughs> so um so without saying much, I will say the the parallels of that fatherlessness um is jaw dropping, and I I did not know about. Kyle Rittenhouse's upbringing and uh, the the challenges that he faced and and once I saw that it explained a lot 
it explained a lot because one of the big conversations a lot of people had about Kyle Rittenhouse and his decision to do what he did to go out there as a young boy. How old was he again? 19? Was he 19? Nine, no, he's 17. Nine, even? 17 oh, with an 17. AR 15 wandering through a war zone. And, yeah. but, if you're, but if you're a good conservative, the dogma you've been fed is that Kyle Rittenhouse is just an unimpeachable Second Amendment martyr. That's all right. you're allowed to believe. And all you're allowed, yeah. That, and you're and you're Antifa, right? right. <laughs> like, oh, you yeah. must be Antifa. It's like, nah, yeah. nah, you nah, can't nah, win. Nah, you literally can't win. I, I whatever like, your opinion. I talk to conservative radio hosts. I'm like, okay, if your 17 year old said, I'm going to strap on an AR 15 and wander into a war zone, would you let him? Right. Would well, you, you know what? I, no, it's, I love that you on, said bro. that. You wouldn't. Yeah, I love that you said that because I have to be honest with you. I came from it from the perspective of a mom. I'm a mom. I have daughters. I don't have sons, but I'm a mom. And as a mom, there is no way in hell my child would be going out there into, you know, what is essentially a war zone um, and and do that. He would not be allowed. I would tie him down to a chair. There's no way in hell I would allow that. So that is kind of, you know, that was kind of a thing for me that, um, you know, I get, I get what he was trying to do, what he believed he was trying to do. But as a parent, as a responsible adult, I was sitting there thinking, where are the adults in his life? Like, why, who let right. that happen? You know, take, we have to take some responsibility for our, our kids that, you know, seven or 17, that's still our child and you're responsible. And that was a question I had that, you know, where are these, where are the parents of this kid that they would allow that? And, uh, and you're so right. People were like, no, he's a hero. He's, you know, like, okay. I mean, you know, he's got to live with that for the rest of his life now. This is a life altering um, event. Yeah, I mean, I think know. what happened is, so there was this cascade of lies related to Jacob Blake. And mm -hmm. I think understandably people of a more moderate or right-leaning disposition, once they at least sensed or could taste that they were being lied to, it right. fueled maybe an overreaction on the right for Kyle Rittenhouse, mm -hmm. where it became, okay, well, then we're going to say Rittenhouse is purely, he's, uh, he's, he's the next great American hero. Right. Right. Second Amendment martyr. He was uh, a young, beautiful idealist mm -hmm. and that he, baby uh, face, yeah, baby face idealist and that there's no, there's no room for criticism of him. Right. And again, in our documentary, what we, what we say is we don't say that Kyle Rittenhouse was a bad guy. No. Um, I actually, my sense is that he was driven by a genuine idealism and mm -hmm. there had been a catastrophic collapse of law and order in Kenosha. There was right. no one there to protect private businesses. There was right. not, but at the same time, he's 17 years old, right? Mm -hmm. And a 17 year old boy is going to be flooded with dreams of heroic achievement. Yes. He's going just to say a little bit of hero complex. Wrist, and it's up to fathers yeah. to properly mold and channel those kind of ancient male energies properly mm -hmm. channeled. They lead to glory right. improperly channeled. They lead to broken bones and violent chaos. Mm -hmm. Okay. And yeah. what we saw happen in Kenosha was a lot of broken bones and violent chaos. And Kyle mm -hmm. Rittenhouse was an essential contributor to that. He was. Yeah. And what I like to, you know, for more conservative audiences to point out is that Ryan Balsh, who was basically the kind of de facto leader of the private militia police force that had been set up around this used car pod, has himself during Kyle's trial said the second that Kyle walked, the second that Kyle joined us, we thought that he was young, mm. inexperienced and naive. And we repeatedly had to scold him mm. for unnecessarily instigating conflicts with some of these protesters and rioters. And Ryan Balsh had committed himself early that evening to mm -hmm. basically attaching himself to Kyle Rittenhouse's hip to, wow. to, to keep him safe. Mm -hmm. and you can see from a lot of the trial footage in almost all the footage of Kyle, Ryan Balsh is right next to him yeah. the whole time, you know, as mm -hmm. a kind of protector father figure. And then that night, Kyle gets turned around and detached from Balsh's protection. Mm -hmm. And it's within a matter of minutes that the shooting starts. Yeah. Exactly what Balsh had predicted and worried about is what occurs. Exactly what happens. That Kyle no longer has a wiser kind of, you know, substitute right. father figure to protect him. Yeah. Wow.
Wow. It's, you know, it, and, and I think one of the really important things I, I, I want to say for anyone watching this or commenting here um, is that this is the way this documentary is done is you present facts. You know, this isn't you're not telling anybody how to think about the events or the people involved. You let people draw their own conclusions and you basically say, like, here's here's the facts. Here's what actually happened in, in both uh, situations. Here's what actually happened A to Z. Here are the here is the truth of it. You decide how you want to feel about that. And then there is this huge component of this fatherlessness and the ties of that. And um, for me, it was very hard to not sit back and say, how does that not have any have anything to do with this? And, you know, maybe somebody else will watch it and go, nope, nope, not buying it, not buying it. That's not the case. I don't know how you can walk away thinking that, but but you leave it so that people can make that decision yeah. for themselves. And I, and, I, and I like that. I like that. Yeah. I don't really care what people think. I know we're yeah. right. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. It's fine. That's fine. Yeah, that part what, of my twenty-two-year-old self has not disappeared. No, a lot that's of evolution, good. But in terms of a a a a um, exceptional level, maybe a blind level of self-confidence, mm -hmm. which has probably been my greatest asset during those periods in which I was completely economically useless, that's not gone away. And I don't particularly care if people don't buy it. I know, I know what's happened. And you know, you go. We went to Kenosha for a couple of days, and this is mm -hmm. maybe two years after everything had gone down. Mm -hmm. And it's wild to see that it's still a raw wound for people, wow. in part because they know how catastrophically the corporate media had failed to properly cover what happened there. I mean, mm -hmm. it's still very raw. And one of the um, one of the days we were there, uh, we actually went and filmed at the historic Black Business District again, mm -hmm. where you can go there, and there's large stretches of blocks that are craters where black owned businesses used to be. That's the legacy, that is the sustained long tail legacy of Black Lives Matter in Kenosha, Wisconsin, all right? That's just facts, yeah. right? Yeah. While we were there, a police officer pulled up, um, I think as he saw me and I'm just like, I'm fucking, I'm a hipster and I got no socks <laughs> on and I'm like, what do you have this camera on? And he, uh, <laughs> he kind of, we just start, we start chatting. Mm -hmm. And I, within a matter of a minute, I'm just telling him what, what we're doing and what my thesis is about what happened in Kenosha. Mm -hmm. And he instantly says to me, like, that's exactly right. This guy, who was a black police officer, though, mm -hmm. he, like, without, with very little prompting, talks about the fact that his dad and mom had home-cooked meals for him every mm -hmm. single night. Wow. Wow. He knows how deeply that shaped him. Wow. And on the flip side, now that he's become an officer in the Kenosha Police Department, he recounts to me how, over the course of his job, the most heartbreaking thing is to be called someplace in Kenosha and to see parents or adults in some act of violent mm -hmm. abuse and seeing their kid there and getting to watch the trauma in real time. Mm -hmm. And then 20 years later, getting called back, back to that same block mm -hmm. and that traumatized kid is now a traumatized adult yep. repeating the cycle of trauma for his or her own kids. Wow. Just getting to watch like nothing has changed. Yeah. Nothing has improved. And this will repeat indefinitely without mm -hmm. profound cultural restructuring. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a dismal cycle. And, uh, and I know speaking for my husband and of course that officer, um, you know, to witness that on such um, a repetitive level is, is so disheartening. And, um, frustrating because it doesn't have to be that way. And it's, it's very sad. It's, it's a true, um, you know, probably I would say the biggest takeaway from the documentary is, wow, what a tragedy, what a tragedy that is continuously played out in our society. And, um, and it's hard though, because there's no neat policy solutions for it. And there's no neat political talking points to be drawn from it. Right. Like you can do things on the margins to make the modern American economy more accommodating to adult males, right? Mm -hmm. You can, you know, males that maybe have hundred IQs that, you know, 50 years ago, there would have been a unionized auto manufacturing job for them, mm -hmm. which would have guaranteed steady employment, a sense of purpose, a sense of dignity and enough money that they could tend to a family. Mm -hmm. And, a lot of those jobs have disappeared, obviously, and there's things you can try to do on the margin to try to generate them. Right. Um, 
But I think that like at best is maybe 20% of the solution mm -hmm. is, in, is found in the realm of politics and hard public policy. Yeah. The other 80% is cultural and spiritual. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing to be done other than advance particular messages mm -hmm. related to what it means to be a grown ass man, right? Mm -hmm. I think this is probably what accounts for the astonishing popularity of a guy like Jordan Peterson, or even on a lesser level, you know, Joe Rogan, right? Sure. Yeah, and both. And it's really. up to individual mm -hmm. men, regardless of their level of base level of trauma or dysfunction, mm -hmm. to make better choices. Yeah, break that <laughs> cycle. Choices. Break the cycle, man. And making oh. better choices is not the same thing as posting on social media that you're making better choices, right? Right. Yeah, it's not. You can't, you can't be done in a meme. Drive, and it's not fun and nobody's going to acknowledge or like it. I mean, right. trust me, this weekend was a lot, I feel, of me making good sacrificial choices without any social media feedback from mm. my, my three kids on a rainy day on Sunday, attempting to navigate a game of Parcheesi that was very <laughs> different than we'd initially envisioned. <laughs> my youngest <laughs> but, three decided to start stealing everybody's pieces. Again, I tried to re retain loving, zen, present, father, calm. Didn't always work <laughs> out that way. It didn't no, what, what are way. the ages of your kids? Uh, my daughter's seven and my sons are five and three. Oof, yeah. 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 You're in the thick of it. That's yeah, for sure. We still got diapers up in my house. I know we're <laughs> not out of it yet. I know that there's a, a sweet spot to come when we get out of the diapers yes. and I don't have to worry about my sons uh, doing anything you know, completely r ridiculous physically with themselves. Yeah. There's a sweet spot there. And then adolescents and teenagers uh, we'll, we'll enter the house and there's a whole new set of challenges there. We're almost oh, yeah. there. We're almost in the sweet spot. That's awesome. Yeah. You, uh, you parents of boys, I, I, I'm a mother and grandmother of all girls, all girls. Wow. And, uh, yeah. And, uh, I'm so baffled by boys, you know, and exactly why you said they just throw themselves everywhere. They're just so physical in everything that they do. And, and, you know, I'm like a, I'm like a, that helicopter, I'm not that bad, but you know, I tease myself and say, I'm like a helicopter mom and grandmother. And, and I have to like, sew my mouth shut to make myself not say, be careful, you know, every two seconds. And, right. you know, and speaking of Jordan B. P B Peterson, um, you know, he had this thing that he put out about, you know, letting your children do dangerous things, um, in a careful way or in an observed way or whatever. Um, and I took that to heart. Like I have to stop saying constantly, be careful, be careful, be careful, and just let them explore their world as long as it's, you know, not something they can get truly um, injured by or, or whatever. And that's hard. That's really I think hard. It's the balance, right? It's the masculine yeah. and the feminine, sort of this ancient dialectic, these ancient mm -hmm. rhythms that have kind of developed over the course of hundreds of thousands of of homo sapiens being on earth. Mm -hmm. And the ideal is that balance. And there's actually no definitive right answer to it. It's some yeah. combination of dads at their best will encourage risk taking mm -hmm. and, and be okay with kids incurring certain levels of physical damage, not psychological damage. Although it's okay for them to have psychological challenges, yes. but that can degrade into neglect for dads. Right. And moms are good at at the love and the warmth mm -hmm. and the protection, but that can devolve into what's now known as like helicopter parenting or the right. kind of neurotic micromanaging of parenting of parents, mm -hmm. and which which itself has its own psychological costs when you deny kids the opportunity to go and challenge themselves in the real world, and they need to have a little bit of resistance in order to build up the mind muscles that they're going to need in adulthood. Yeah, it's so true, and, and, and no small part, a lot of the you know, incredible psychological dysfunction of, you know, 20 somethings mm -hmm. is because there's been an excess of that feminine energy in their childhood where yeah. not enough risk taking and they spent large portions of their youth on screens mm. or in tightly controlled, soft air. And they're also in turn also saturated in a kind of woke politics that's right. all purely about affirmation. Mm -hmm. And it's not about encouraging risk-taking and encouraging self-development and self-betterment. It's right. just a message of you're beautiful the way that you are. Particularly right, yeah. with like an unorthodox, right. heterodox uh, identity. Yeah. Like that identity, that thing generated by your chromosomes mm -hmm. should be the foundation of your sense of dignity and respect and self-worth, which is like obviously a, 
an extremely bad message to be sending to kids. And now that's getting pumped into them in every single possible channel. Of yes. Video. Yeah. That's why, yeah there's... Live, that's why we live out in the woods. Yeah. <laughs> that's why we live out in the woods. Yeah. I'll tell you what, for as much as a helicopter parent, I was in some aspects, there was no, you know, I remember my, my older daughter when she was about 12 or 13, wanting to uh, try out the goth look, which I don't know what they call it now, but back then they called it goth, you know, with the black nails and the black lips and all that stuff. And I laughed at her. I said, no, <laughs> you can wear a black shirt and that's yeah. it. You know, and you're, you're not doing that. That's it's not. And then it was done. It was over with. She stomped away. She was mad. And, you know, but yeah, parenting balance, all of those things are, um, you know, they do have a better chance of making a more rounded, well-rounded adult for sure. Uh, yeah. Last question for you, well, if you don't mind. What do you, besides, I want you to tell everybody again where they can find the documentary, where they can find more, all that stuff. But um, I was curious before, like what, what are you hoping people take away from the documentary? Yeah, again, so people can just watch it. Uh, Good Kid Productions youtube channel so just good yeah. kid productions or you can also you can find it just by typing in broken boys of kenosha they can also go to goodkidproductions.com where you can see all our social media feeds and uh, a lot of the other docs that we've done for our channel and for some of our our dearly beloved clients mm -hmm. and um the uh what i want them to take away I mean, at the very least, I just want to generate more reflexive skepticism of standard issue corporate mainstream medias about viral news events. I mean, we saw this go down in Memphis just like a couple of days ago. Yeah. In terms of an event happens, the 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 main corporate media storytellers are saturated in a kind of hyper left progressive politics, and they immediately try to jam it into that storyline mm -hmm. in ways that were like so awkward that that attempt kind of fell apart because it, yeah. it was difficult to do given that it was five no way. police officers. Mm -hmm. And, but I think the skepticism, I'd like it to, I'd like it to retain somewhat of a bipartisan flavor Okay, where I think I you that. ought to be skeptical of MSNBC and CNN and right. Good Morning America. I, I do think those are broken and, and corrupted, deeply corrupted yeah. institutions that pump anti-truth into the American public. Absolutely. But there are ways in which like the Fox News counterbalancing also have their own set of dogmas. It's true. And mm -hmm. both of them in combination will end up missing kind of these deeper, deeper stories that don't fit a neat political narrative. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Uh, Rob, thank you so much for coming on and sharing this with us. Um, I, I cannot encourage people enough to go and watch this documentary and um, just, you know, get your dose of truth. Well done, truth. Thank you very much for coming on. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Absolutely, family. If you're looking for the perfect gift for the reader in your life, why not check out one of my books? They're all available on Amazon and most major online book retailers, as well as elsacurrent.com.